Thank you very much, Antonios. Um, it is a real pleasure to kick off the first plenary session of the London Conference on this beautiful London morning. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Judge Iwasawa of the ICJ. Unlike Antonios, I cannot resist a little bit of introduction. Um, Judge Iwasawa has been a member of the court since June 2018. During the past four years, he has heard a range of fascinating cases that touch on this conference themes, including the recent indication of provisional measures in Ukraine and Russia. Before his election to the court, he was no stranger to judicial office. Um, he was the judge and vice president of the Asian Development Bank Administrative Tribunal. His um, expertise in human rights was recognised by his appointment to the Human Rights Committee. He was a member of that committee for over 10 years, serving as chairperson twice. And he discharged these weighty responsibilities while pursuing a distinguished career um, academically. To name but a few appointments, he was Professor of International Law at the University of Tokyo, Vice Chair of the ILA and its um, Special Rapporteur on um, Human Rights and Practice, Lecturer at the Hague Academy, Member of the Institute, and President of the Japanese Society of International Law. And happily, he has a particular connection with this jurisdiction, having visited the Lauspak Centre on three occasions during his career. In addition to his many responsibilities at present, he has found the time to write a book um, on the subject of his celebrated Hague lecture, Domestic Application of International Law, and it's scheduled to be published later this year, so do look out for it. So with the depth and breadth of his expertise in international law, the judge is uniquely placed to discuss the role of international law and institutions in dealing with crises and emergencies. Now with that, this morning, he and I will focus on three different subjects. These dovetail neatly with Judge Iwasawa's expertise. He aims to set the scene for the panels that will address those issues over the coming days. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because the issues that we are discussing at this conference are so topical in many respects, so controversial, um, they are, of course, the subject of argument before the ICJ, like other international courts and tribunals. For that reason, we've chosen to focus our discussion on the legal frameworks that courts such as the ICJ will use to decide these interesting questions and leave the answers um, to them to our esteemed panellists over the coming days and perhaps uh, to uh, the bar at the conference dinner. With that in mind, uh, Judge Iwasawa, um, I'd like to turn to the first topic, the International Settlement of Disputes in Emergencies, which we will discuss on uh, panel five. Well, thank you very much, uh, Belinda, for your kind introduction. I'm very pleased uh, to have been invited to give a keynote address at this important conference. So let's start our conversation with the International Settlement of Disputes. Thank you, Judge. Well, the natural starting point, I think, um, is, of course, the ICJ. So, Judge Iwasawa, what, in your view, is the role of the court in emergencies? Well, as the ICJ has a general subject matter juris a jurisdiction, it can play an important role in the international settlement of disputes in times, in times of emergency. However, the ICJ cannot independently seek to resolve disputes which limit its capacity to address emergency situations. As you know, two types of cases may proceed to the ICJ, advisory opinions and contentious cases. Now, Judge, I'm not a known mathematician, but um, by my count, over the course of the last sort of 75 years or so, I think there have been only 28 advisory opinions and one during your tenure on the court. Can these advisory opinions, in your view, still be a useful tool in dealing with emergencies where time is typically of the essence? Well, before addressing whether advisory opinions are a useful tool in emergency situations, let me briefly address the, court, the, the advisory jurisdiction. As you know, the advisory jurisdiction of ICJ is available to UN organs, special agencies, and the IAEA. The General Assembly and the Security Council may request an advisory opinion on any legal question. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, special aid agencies may request an advisory opinion on legal questions arising within the scope of their activities. 
This requirement may create an ob obstacle for a special agency when requesting an advisory opinion in emergencies, as can be seen in the request made by the WHO on the use of nuclear weapons. Advisory opinions are not legally binding, but in the case between Mauritius and Maldives, the ITLOS chamber gave great weight to the advisory opinion of the ICJ on the Chagos archipelago. Now, uh, turning to the role advisory opinion may play in emergency situations, it is important to note that the considerable length of time is needed mm -hmm. for advisory opinions procedures to conclude. Specifically, it may take some time for states to agree on the request and for the court to complete the advisory proceedings. Thus, advisory opinions may not be the best way to clarify the law in situations of extreme urgency. However, advisory opinions procedures may still be useful where the emergency is more long-term, such as some issues relating to the environment. And moreover, by clarifying the law, advisory opinions may also help prevent future crises from arising. So as you say, Judge, they do have real utility, but generally when a state is faced with a crisis or an emergency, it will prefer to bring a contentious case. And why, in your view, is instituting proceedings in that way such a powerful tool um, in that situation of emergency? Um, the dispute underlying a contentious case is generally reflect deeper political tensions. And therefore, by issuing a judgment, the court may not only settle the legal dispute between the parties, but also alleviate the politi political tensions. In addition, where there is a power imbalance between the parties to a dispute, bringing proceeding before the ICJ may help level the playing field. In cases where the conflict is intensifying, the court's judgment may also provide the right moment for the parties to negotiate. Now, it is important to note that the fact that an issue is before the Security Council does not prevent the ICJ from exercising its jurisdiction over the same matter. Mm -hmm. The court has addressed the crisis at the same time as the Security Council or at the later time. So, Judge Iwasawa, if we come on to the court's jurisdiction, um, how, in your view, is it most likely to be exercised and, and engaged in an emergency situation? Well, as you all know, the court jurisdiction in contentious proceedings derived from the consent of the, of the states and the form of the consent governs the scope of the ju court jurisdiction. The consent may take various forms, as you know. In emergency situations, special agreements may not be practical as the states concerned are not likely to conclude such an agreement. If an emergency is created by an action of a state, establishing the jurisdiction through forum prorogatum is even more unlikely. As for the optional clause of the statute, only about one third of the parties to the statute have made declarations accepting the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. However, between states which have made declarations, jurisdiction may be established in times of emergency. If states are parties to a general treaty on this peace settlement, such as the Pact of Bogota, jurisdiction may be established by means of such a treaty. And finally, if a treaty contains a compromissive clause which allows the parties to submit the dispute relating to the interpretation or application of the treaty to the ICJ, the court can have jurisdiction based on that clause. Now, Judge Iwasawa, um, at least on the basis of, of my own experience, what one sees sometimes um, from a respondent state before the court um, is to make as many preliminary objections to the application as possible, um, identifying a, a, as many credible grounds as they can. 
So in your experience during your time on the court, what objections are, are typically made in situations involving an emergency? If a state bring a dispute to the ICJ based on a compromissive clause of a treaty, mm -hmm. The respondent often challenges the court jurisdiction, arguing that the dispute does not relate to the interpretation or application of the treaty. In such a case, the court addresses the issue using the following formula. Whether the acts complained of by the applicant or the claims of the applicant fall within the provision of the treaty. If they do, the court has jurisdiction that's your material over the dispute. If not, the court lacks jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Additionally, compromissive clause of a treaty normally provides that the party can submit the dispute to the court. Therefore, the respondent also often challenges the court, court's jurisdiction, by arguing that there is no dispute. The court has explained when a dispute exists, in such cases as Mabromatis, 1924, Interpretation of Peace Treaties, 1950, and South West Africa, 1962. The court determines whether a dispute exists in light of the formulas established in these cases. Now, it is important to note that the court determination is a matter of substance and not the question of form or procedure. The court takes into account any statements or documents exchanged between the parties, as well as any exchanges made in multilateral settings. If there is no dispute, the court lacks jurisdiction. Judge Iwasawa, I think you, you absolutely rightly mentioned the seminal judgment of Matt Vermatis, but in the context of an emergency, the recent judgment of the court in the Gambia and Myanmar is perhaps particularly instructive. The court made clear, as I understand it in that case, that the respondent need not expressly oppose the claims of the applicant state. And in that case, the party's broad the statements in the broader forum of the General Assembly um, constituted sort of sufficient opposition for the requirement. And one might imagine that this acts as a useful precedent in times of crisis and emergency, particularly where a state is acting um, uh, in the collective interest. Now, Judge, the dispute requirement is not the only um, threshold for which an applicant state must provide evidence of engagement with the respondent. Compromissory clauses, of course, may require this. And in a fast-moving emergency situation, such criteria may just prove very difficult to meet. So how has the court, in your experience, treated this obstacle to the exercise of its jurisdiction? Well, compromissory clauses may also contain procedural preconditions. The respondent often challenges the court jurisdiction by arguing that the procedural preconditions are not met. Mm -hmm. A notable example of a procedural precondition is that the parties were unable to settle the dis dispute by negotiation. The court has stressed that the concept of negotiation requires a genuine attempt by the parties to settle the dispute by negotiation. The precondition of negotiation is met only when there has been a failure of negotiations mm -hmm. or when negotiations have become futile or deadlocked. The precondition set out in Article 22 of Third is more, uh, are more complicated. It provides that a dispute which is not settled by negotiation or by the procedures expressly provided for in this convention may be referred to the ICJ. The court has held that these conditions, namely negotiations or the procedures before the third committee, are alternative and not cumulative conditions. Judge, you mentioned Article 22 of CERD, which obviously has been quite a feature of the court's uh, jurisprudence in cases of emergency. Um, one sees an applicant states um, invoking it relatively frequently, albeit perhaps unsuccessfully in Georgia and Russia, um, a very well-known case. And in that case, as you say, we see that negotiations are very much distinct from mere protests or disputations, which might be sufficient to satisfy the dispute requirement. 
And I would have thought that the need to jump through these kinds of procedural hoops may mean that Article 22 and its equivalents are a less attractive source of jurisdiction in cases of crisis, um, of course, if one has an option. So, Judge, that brings us to admissibility and the application of this well-known threshold in emergency cases. Um, the court's judgment, again, in the Gambia and Myanmar dealt with two of them, abuse of process and standing. Um, I believe, and I understand you share this view, that standing is, is particularly relevant in an emergency context, as an applicant state may wish to bring a claim on behalf of a group of states or on behalf of an international organisation, as in that case. So, Judge Iwasawa, how has the court approached the question of standing in these kinds of crisis contexts? Um, in emergency situations, when a non-injured state brings a case before the ICJ, the respondent may challenge the standing mm -hmm. of the applicant, as you pointed out. Then it becomes necessary for the court to examine whether the obligations in question are obligations ergominous and whether the applicant bring the case even when it was not injured by the act, act of the respondent. The ICJ addressed this issue first in obligations to prosecute or extradite Belgium Senegal in 2012. The court found that the parties to the Convention Against Torture have a common interest in the compliance with the obligations in question and refer to them as obligations ergominus partes. In the judgment of July this year, which you alluded to, the court concluded that the Genocide Convention similarly contained obligations ergominus partes. Now, it is interesting to consider whether this might mean in the context, in the context of international environmental law. Multilateral environment agreements often contain a compromissive clause which allows the parties to, uh, to bring a dispute relating to the interpretation or application of the agreement before the ICJ. A question may be raised as to whether the multilateral environment agreement contains obligations ergominus partes and whether a non-injured state can bring a case before the ICJ. Now, some commentators have explained that in Welling in Antarctica, the court implicitly recognized the ergonomous character of the International Convention for the regulation of whaling. I fully expect that these sorts of questions will be explored in the context of our panels over the coming days. So, just as a matter of practicality, Judge Iwasawa, the introduction of a preliminary objections phase obviously lengthens the proceedings and delays that critical determination on the merits. Disputes involving emergencies, crises and the like obviously require quick and decisive action, typically. So let's then turn to the court's um, provisional merit measures jurisdiction, which is really invoked with increasing frequency. In your view, how valuable are these measures in times of crisis? Well, provisional measures of the ICJ can play important roles in times of emergency. In cases requiring an urgent response, the court has been able to promptly intervene through the ordering of provisional measures. Mm. Provisional measures are important in allowing the court to preserve the respective rights of either party as well as its own judicial function in the proceedings. They can also contribute to alleviating tensions created by an emergency. Now, as you know, requests for provisional measures are treated in an urgent manner. Such requests will have priority over all other cases. A party's known appearance before that court does not prevent the indication of provisional measures as in Ukraine versus Russia. Where a party requests provision measures, the court may indicate measures that are in whole or in part other than those requested. In Lagrange in 2001, the court declared that provision measures are binding on the parties. This point had been discussed extensively by commentators before 2001. Now, as you have noted, it has become common 
for an applicant to request provisional measures in recent years. In the ICJ, the bulk of requests for provisional measures have been made in the recent decades. While only two requests were made before 1972, more than 40 requests have been made since 1990. In the 20 cases instituted during the last five years, provisional measures have been sought in about half of them. Requests for provisional measures are increasing in the it loss too. As one commenter has stated, it is a time of surprising popularity of, for provisional measures. <laughs> Uh, Judge, since the court's determination in Legrand to which you refer, I think it's fair to say that jurisprudence under Article 41 has really gathered momentum. The court is ready to dispose of requests that it doesn't believe to, to meet um, the necessary criteria or otherwise unmeritorious. The UAE's um, request is a case in point. It's also willing to indicate measures beyond those requested, as you say, and we really see this in Ukraine and, and Russia most recently. Judge Iwisawa, in considering this case law, um, how would you describe the court's um, current approach, really, to, to the indication of provisional measures? Uh, certain conditions must be satisfied for, for the court to indicate provisional measures. Such conditions are important as provisional measures are binding on the parties and may, may result in substantial limitations placed on them. There are five conditions, and let me uh, explain in some detail because they're important. First, the court must have prima facie jurisdiction. The condition of prima facie jurisdiction seeks to balance the requirement that the court not act where it has no jurisdiction with the need for urgent measures. If a state brings a dispute, uh, a dispute to the ICJ based on compromissive clause of the treaty, as I observed earlier, the respondent may argue that the dispute does not relate to the interpretation or application of the treaty. In the phase of provisional measures, the court examines whether the acts complained of by the applicant are capable of falling within the provision of the treaty. In this phase, the court does not need to determine definitively that it has jurisdiction. Rather, the court makes the de determination only on a prima facie basis. The threshold is lower in this phase than in the merits phase. But it's not too low. Since 1995, the court, uh, there has been several cases in which the court concluded that it had no jurisdiction, even prima facie. But because the court does not determine its jurisdiction definitively, in some cases, after issuing a provisional measures order, the court determined that it had no jurisdiction. And I must add that the standing of the applicant may be challenged in this phase too, as in the Gambia versus Myanmar. Now, the second condition is that the rights asserted by the applicant or the claims of the applicant must at least be plausible. This condition was introduced in obligation to prosecute or extradite in 2009 and since then, the court has consistently required this condition. Thus, it has become one of the most important conditions of provision measures. The condition of plausibility has been accepted by the ITLOS and interstate arbitral tribunals as well. A number of commenters have examined this condition, discussing in particular the threshold. Now, the third, a link must be established between the rights, which are the subject of the proceedings, and the measures requested. The rights to be preserved by provisional measures are the rights which must be protected by the final judgment of the court. In the case concerning the arbitral award of 1989, Guinea Business versus Senegal, the validity of the arbitral award was the subject of the proceedings. However, the applicant requested provision measures relating to the substantive issues dealt with in the arbitral award. The court rejected the request on the basis of the lack of a link 
between the rights which were the subject of the proceedings and the measures requested. The court has indicated that the request must have a sufficient connection with the merit of the case. That's the sufficiency is the test of the link. Now, fourth, there must be a risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights. Article 41 of the statute provides that the court shall indicate provision measures if it considers that circumstances so require. From this provision, it should be obvious that the risk of irreparable prejudice is required. In 2018, the court made a slight modification to the formulation of this condition. According to the new formulation, the court has the power to indicate provision measures when there is a risk that irreparable prejudice could be caused to rights or when the alleged disregard of such rights may entail irreparable consequences. When human lives are at risk, for example, irreparable prejudice has been recognized. Now, fifth, there must be urgency. The power of the court to indicate provision measures will be exercised only when there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused before the court gives its final decision. That's the condition of irreparable prejudice and urgency are considered, usually considered together. When the respondent gives sufficient assurances, the court may find that there is no urgency, as in the cases of great belt and obligations to prosecute or extradite. So, Judge Iwasawa, let's assume that a state can satisfy each of the five um, criteria that you have outlined. It succeeds in its request. Provisional, provisional measures arguably have little use if the respondent state does not comply with them, and we can all think of a recent high-profile example. So what steps um, can and should the court take when faced with the blatant disregard of its orders? Well, while the provisional measures are binding on the parties, the court cannot enforce them. Nevertheless, the court can take into consideration non-compliance non with provisional measures in the final judgment. Now, there has been a new development in the monitoring of the implementation of provision measures. In 2020, the ICJ adopted new Article 11 of the resolution concerning the internal, internal judicial practice. The article provides for the establishment of an ad hoc committee composed of three judges to assist the court in monitoring the implementation of provision measures. Well, the court, of course, has long had the power to request information on matters connected with the indication of provisional measures, as it did, for example, in the case of Jadhav. But perhaps this new monitoring function to which you refer provides the court with a mechanism to use that information that it receives a bit more proactively and with a little bit more muscle. This, of course, might depend on the nature of the recommendations that the, court, that the court's ad hoc committee is, is willing to provide in situations of non-compliance and exactly how public they are, are made. Another um, recent development, which I think is of particular interest to us all, is what one could describe as the real flurry of applications to intervention by third states in the case of Ukraine and Russia. Is this, do you think, uh, Judge Iwasawa, something that's likely to remain exceptional in the ICJ? Or what, might we sort of see a change in practice um, approaching that in other international bodies, um, such as the dispute resolution mechanisms in the WTO? Um, in the WTO dispute settlement procedures, intervention by third states is a regular practice. Mm -hmm. In contrast, before the ICJ, requests for intervention have not been so frequent until recently. This difference may be explained by the unique nature of the WTO dispute settlement procedures. While the WTO procedures are bilateral in nature, they have the character of international supervision or control international. The WTO procedures work as a mechanism to secure compliance with the WTO agreement. Maintenance of a free world trade system 
serve the common interest of the members. Therefore, where one member files a complaint with the WTO alleging that its benefits are notified, the complaint serves the community interest and has the effect of acting on behalf of the international community. In contrast, dispute settlement before the ICJ is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly bilateral in nature, unless a case involves allegations of violations of our obligations ergo omnes. If cases relating to obligations ergo omnes increase in the ICJ, intervention may also increase. Now, Article 62 of the statute provides for intervention by a state that has an interest of a legal nature. Requests under Article 62 have been made only in nine cases and approved only in three cases. Article 63 provides for intervention when the construction of a convention is in question. And pursuant to Article 63, a party to the convention has a right to intervene in the proceedings. Nonetheless, the court has examined the admissibility of such interventions and has rejected one request. Before Ukraine versus Russia, requests under Article 63 were made only in three cases and approved in two of these cases. In Ukraine versus Russia, multiple requests for intervention have been made by a number of third states. This is truly exceptional. Yes, you say a number. I think at last count, it's 18 states um, that have filed declarations of intervention most recently on, on Friday um, evening with um, that of Portugal. And it'll be fascinating to see if Ukraine and, and Russia is indeed an outlier, as, as you say, or whether this is the beginning of a new trend, perhaps, of intervention in cases of international significance, be they treaty-based, obligation, ergo omnes, etc. So, Judge, I'd now like to move, if I may, to discuss this, the second topic um, that we had in mind, which um, concerns the protection of human rights and climate emergency. These issues, of course, will be explored by leading experts in panels one and seven, respectively. Human rights, uh, Judge Iwasawa, is a field in which you specialise prior to your election to the court and one which I understand you follow closely today. Yeah, I, I left the Human Rights Committee in 2018, but I certainly uh, um, follow the work of the committee closely. So when one thinks of human rights in an emergency context, in a state of emergency, one often thinks of derogation, um, to which Lady Arden referred, rather than protection. Um, and the relevant treaty mechanisms which allow one to do this, for example, Article 15 of the ECHR. So, Judge, what restrictions um, it, it, that you've seen are in place that work effectively to ensure that human rights are protected to the maximum extent in, in states of emergency? Um, well, in times of emergency, states may be unable to continue fulfilling their human rights obligations. This, ne this necessarily raises the question of the extent to which international law permits states to derogate from their human rights obligations. Many human rights um, instruments contain a general emergency clause. This clause allows states to derogate from their human rights obligations on a temporary basis if certain conditions are met. Article 4 of the ICCPR is an example. Article 4 ensures that there are safeguards in place by spelling out certain conditions. First, there must be a public emergency threatening the life of the nation, such as armed conflict and environmental catastrophes. Second, the state must have made an official proclamation that such a state of emergency exists. Third, the measures adopted by the state are limited to what is strictly required by the emergency situation, which raises the requirement of proportionality. Fourth, the measures may not be inconsistent with the state's of other obligations under international law. Importantly, state may not derogate from certain provisions, even in times of emergency. In other words, certain human rights are non-derogable. 
any state that derogates from provision of the ICCPR is to immediately inform the other states through the Secretary General of the provisions from which it has derogated from and its reasons. Mm -hmm. The Human Rights Committee plays an important role in ensuring that states act in compliance with Article 4. States have referred to a wide variety of internal difficulties in their notifications. States have derogated from certain human rights obligations in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In 1920, uh, 2020, mm. the committee issued a statement in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. It reminded states that derogations from ICCPR obligations may only be to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the public health situation. The committee also stressed that states should not derogate from covenant rights when they can attain the public health objectives by invoking the restrictions set out in the relevant provision of the ICCPR. Well, the committee's description of the way in which the Article 4 restrictions and conditions operate does appear to be borne out in practice. Although the COVID-19 pandemic gave rise to an unprecedented number of derogations from the ICCPR, we've seen that the majority of states' parties did not declare and notify a state of emergency under this provision. Instead, they relied on the inbuilt restrictions to which you refer. Um, for example, those permitting measures necessary for the protection of public health. And at first blush, one might assume that operating in a state of normalcy is, is more likely to guarantee human rights protection. But I think invoking Article 4 arguably subjects those emergency powers that are going to be used to a greater degree of scrutiny and ultimately perhaps leads to more targeted measures of shorter duration, given the strict criteria to which you've referred. Judge Iwasawa, let's move on to the, the substance of the rights themselves. Which rights, in your view, gain particular significance in, in times of crisis or emergency? Well, I think the right to life can have particular significance in times of emergency. Article 4 of the ICCPR, the ICCPR makes the right to life non-derogable. This means that even in times of emergency, a state may not derogate from Article 6, which provides for the right to life. Now, the Human Rights Committee adopted General Comment 36 on Article 6 in 2018. In this General Comment, the Committee included within the scope of protection provided by Article 6, environmental degradation, climate change, and unsustainable development. The General Comment states that the obligation of states under international environmental law should inform the content of Article 6 of the ICCPR. It declares that the implementation of the obligations to respect and ensure the right to life depends on measures taken by states to preserve the environment and to protect it against harm, pollution, and climate change. On any view, I think the general comment to which you refer is a significant development of Article 6 in many respects, but in particular concerning environmental degradation and its link to the right to life with dignity. And that aspect we've seen has been deployed um, by litigants in a series of landmark cases, both before the committee and domestic courts. And I understand you've, you've followed these with interest. Yes, indeed, uh, in recent years, a number of cl climate change cases have been filed before domestic courts and international bodies. More than 2,000 cases have been filed so far, and in fact, over 1,200 of them were filed in the last eight years. In those cases, international law, in particular international human rights law, is at times invoked. We thus can observe an increasing human rights-based approach to climate change. Now, one notable example of a case before domestic courts is the one from the Netherlands. In its 1920, uh, 2019 judgment, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands held that the government of the Netherlands was to reduce its greenhouse ga gas emissions by at least 25%. The court found that article, Articles 2 and 8 of the European Commission on Human Rights applied when it came to environmental hazards 
that threatened large groups or the population as a whole. As you know, Article 2 provides for the right to life, and Article 8 provides for the right to respect for private and family life. So, Judge, moving back to the ICCPR, with which you're so familiar, Article 6 that we mentioned earlier has also been invoked in the context of climate change. I understand it. Yes, the Human Rights Committee has issued interesting decisions relating to the impact of climate change on human rights in recent years. So I will explain two decisions given by the committee, one in 2019 and the other in July this year, both after I left the committee. In Teotihuacan versus New Zealand, the committee examined the question of whether Article 6 was violated when a person was deported to a place where climate change posed a threat to their life, in this case, Kiribati. The committee made the following observations. Environmental degradation, climate change, and unsustainable development constitute some of the most pressing and serious threats to the ability to enjoy the right to life. The effects of climate change may expose individuals to a violation of their rights under Article 6, right to life, or Article 7, prohibition of torture or inhuman treatment. Given that the risk of an entire country becoming submerged under water is such an extreme risk, extreme risk, the conditions of life in such a country may become incompatible with the right to life. Now, in this case, the committee accepted that the authors claim that civil rights would render Kiribati uninhabitable. However, it noted that the time frame of 10 to 15 years could allow for intervening acts by Kiribati. The committee thus found that authors' right to life had not been violated. Mm -hmm. This was the first case in which the international treaty body recognized the applicability of the right to life in the context of climate degradation. Looking at all the blogs, for example, the committee's recognition of the potential applicability of Article 6 has been wildly hailed as groundbreaking, if, if not the result uh, of the decision for the complainants, a little disappointing. And considering there's such a high threshold for the invocation of, of Article 6, namely that imminent risk of harm to which one sees reference in the decision, its utility in cases of this kind, as the law stands at least, perhaps may be limited. And one might reasonably say that if Article 6 is not satisfied in the circumstances of Kiribati, then, then when will it be? Well, I will explain uh, another case. In the, July this year, the committee issued another interesting decision. In Billy versus Australia, a group of Torres Strait Islanders brought the communication against Australia for its inaction in relation to climate change. The committee held that Australia had failed to discharge its positive obligation to implement adequate adaptation measures mm -hmm. to protect the author's home, private life, and family in violation of their rights under Article 17 of the ICCPR. The committee also found that the state's failure amounted to a violation of the rights of the minority to maintain their traditional way of life under Article 27. However, the committee did not find a violation of the author's right to life under Article 6. Well, this decision is very much hot off the press, having been issued in, in, in September. And another interesting aspect, it seems to me, of the committee's views are, are the legal consequences that they identify, Judge Iwasawa. The committee, as I recall it, recognised that the Torres Strait Islanders were entitled to full reparation for the harm that they had suffered at the hands of Australia. Australia must pay compensation and take steps to prevent future violations. I also noticed with interest that they have been asked to inform the committee of the steps that they have taken to give effect to its views within 180 days. And we'll wait to see how Australia, with its new Labor government, re responds to that. Um, well, in addition to the Human Rights Committee, I'd like to explain that the Committee on the Rights of the Child issued an interesting, interesting decision in September last year. In Saatchi versus Argentina, 16 children from 12 different countries claim that by failing to mitigate the consequences of climate change, five states had violated their rights to life, health, cultural identity, and the best interest of the child. 
The respondent challenged the jurisdiction of the committee. However, the committee confirmed its jurisdiction, explaining the following. Where transboundary harm occurs, children are under the jurisdiction of the state on whose territory the emission originated. If there is a causal link between the acts of the state and the negative impact on the children located outside its territory. Now, even though the committee in the end found the communication inadmissible for non-exhaustion of domestic remedies, its interpretation of extra, extraterritorial jurisdiction has attracted much attention. And it does seem that the communication uh, judges had real impact, not least in providing a sort of renewed impetus for a new general comment, number 26, on children's rights and the environment. And the committee's reliance on this test of, of causality, as you say, for jurisdiction, does leave the door firmly open for future cases in which there has been a sufficient exhaustion of domestic remedies, or they're simply uh, not available. So Judge Iwiso, I'm moving finally to, to our last topic briefly. We've discussed the substantive obligations that might form the subject of litigation in times of crisis. Of course, then one also needs to turn to the law of state responsibility, allowing a litigant to have recourse against the state for breaches of those substantive obligations. This is an equally important piece of the puzzle, of course, in, in the case law of the ICJ, and happily it will be the subject of panel 10 tomorrow. So let's, if we can, set the scene for that discussion. Um, Judge, what particular application does the law of state responsibility have in times of emergency, in your view? In times, in times of emergency, the law of state responsibility becomes particularly relevant in two contexts. First, when faced with an emergency, particularly of a natural nature, a state may be compelled to take a measure which is inconsistent with its international obligations. Then a question arises whether the non-performance of the obligation can be justified by circumstances precluding wrongfulness. Second, when an emergency is triggered by certain actions of a state, other states may resort to sanctions to stop them. Thank you, Judge Uesawa. So if we can start with the first of the situations that, that you mentioned, circumstances precluding wrongfulness, can you elaborate perhaps a little bit on how you see these playing a role in cases of this kind in the emergency context? So in terms of emergency, state may no longer be able to act in conformity with its international obligations. And if the obligation stems from a treaty, the state may be able to justify the non-performance by means of the exception, exception provisions contained in the treaty. Whether the, the non-performance can be justified depends on the interpretation of the exception provisions. Mm -hmm. In addition, state may invoke circumstances precluding wrongfulness to justify the non-performance. Mm -hmm. The circumstances precluding wrongfulness do not terminate the relevant obligation. They merely allow the state to justify non-performance. And there are four circumstances that are particularly pertinent to the discussion on emergencies. Necessity, distress, force majeure, and countermeasures. And I will address necessity, distress, and force majeure in turn for now. And I will discuss countermeasures later mm -hmm. when I address sanctions. Thank you. So first, uh, necessity. Necessity has been relied upon by states to protect a wide variety of interests of an urgent nature. For example, preserving the very existence of the state and its people during, public, during a public emergency and safeguarding the environment. In Gavchikovo Najmaros, the ICJ confirmed that the state of necessity is a ground recognized by custom international law. At the same time, it observed that such a ground can only be accepted on an exceptional basis. And in that case, the court considered that five basic conditions must be fulfilled. And, it, it, and the court indicated that these conditions reflect custom international law. First, the act must have been occasioned by an essential interest of the state 
Second, that interest must have been threatened by a grave and imminent peril. Third, the act must have been the only means of safeguarding that interest. Fourth, the act must not have seriously impaired an essential interest of the state toward which the obligation existed. And fifth, the state must not have contributed to the occurrence of the state of necessity. And in that case, the court recognized that the first condition was met, mm -hmm. but the others were not. Mm -hmm. In addition, the, a state cannot rely on necessity if the international obligation excludes the possibility of invoking necessity. Now, the fina financial difficulties faced by Argentina in the early 2000s triggered a number of investment arbitrations. In those arbitrations, Argentina invoked not only the exception provision of the investment agreement, but also necessity. Mm -hmm. However, the Argentina's claims of necessity were, for the most part, rejected by the arbitral tribunals. The ILC suggested in the commentary to the Articles on State Responsibility that the incident of Torrey Canyon may qualify as a state, as a case of necessity. As you know, the British government bombed the ship and no international protest resulted. Judge Iwisau, you've mentioned the in investment case law um, back in the um, Argentinian financial crisis and that series of um, fascinating cases that sort of diverge in various ways. It will certainly be um, fascinating and exciting to see how the defence of necessity um, is deployed in the context of the pandemic. One can imagine that the four sort of basic criteria may be met in some circumstances at the height of the pandemic. But I can anticipate um, all sorts of fascinating arguments about the contribution of the state um, through its sort of own incompetence, lack of preparedness, poor decision making, if you will, underfunded health systems, and how that might contribute to the state of necessity. Certainly, perhaps an area to watch and discuss over the course of the next two days. Uh, let me um, turn to distress. It is a situation in which the state has no other reasonable way of saving the author's life or the lives of other persons entrusted to its care. Distress may be invoked, for example, in situations where aircraft or ships have entered the territory of other states due to weather or mechanical failure. Mm -hmm. In Rainbow Warrior, the arbitral tribunal declared that three conditions were required to justify the action of France. First, the existence of very exceptional circumstances of extreme urgency. Second, the re-establishment re of the original situation of compliance as soon as the reason of, reasons of emergency had disappeared. And third, the existence of a good faith effort to try to obtain the consent of the other state. And in this case, the tribunal accepted the justification of distress only with regard to the male officer, but not the female officer. A state cannot rely on distress where the act is likely to have created a comparable or greater peril. Mm -hmm. I now turn to force majeure. An emergency situation may be caused by either a natural disaster or a human intervention. For force majeure, unlike distress, the state must not have the free choice to act consistently with its international obligations. The ILC articles set out three conditions. First, the act must be brought about by an irresistible force or an unseen event. Second, which is beyond the control of the state. And third, which makes it materially impossible to, for, to perform the obligation. Mm -hmm. In Rainbow Warrior, France invoked not only distress, but also force majeure. However, the arbitral tribunal dismissed the defense of force majeure, stating that the test is of absolute and material impossibility. Now, circumstances rendering performance more difficult do not constitute force majeure. In the Serbian loans case, Serbia argued that the First World War had made the payment of loan impossible, but the PCIJ rejected this argument. 
Judge, that brings us to the final issue of sanctions that you identified. How might these be engaged in an emergency context? Now, in addressing sanctions, I think it is important first to clarify what measures we are speaking of. Mm -hmm. As noted by the ILC, the term sanctions is often used to refer to measures taken in accordance with the constituent instrument of international organizations, such as under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. In order for the Security Council to take non-military measures under Article 41 of the Charter, or military measures under Article 42, the Council must determine the exist existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression under Article 39. The Security Council normally reacts to an emergency created by actions of a state However, in 2014, the Security Council determined that the Ebola outbreak constituted a threat to international peace and security. Now, under Article 41 of the Charter, the Security Council can take various non-military measures. It often resorts to economic sanctions, such as prohibition of export and import, arms embargo, financial sanctions, prohibition of investments, and freezing of assets. Other non-military measures include prohibition of travel, restrictions of cultural exchange, banning the entry of airplanes, and inter interruption of diplomatic relations. Arguably more common, though, are the unilateral actions taken by states outside the sort of parameters of Chapter 7, for example. And what is the legal framework um, applying to, to these measures, Judge? Well, states often resort to non-forcible measures without the authorization of the Security Council to get another state to stop a particular conduct. They are often referred to as sanctions, but many international lawyers prefer to avoid referring to them as sanctions. The non-forcible measures taken by a state may not run counter to any international obligation of the state. Where this is the case, it is classified as retortion. It may be an unfriendly act, but it is not inconsistent with the international obligation of the state. Examples include withdrawing voluntary aid programs and imposing limits on diplomatic relations. If an unilateral action of a state qualified as retortion, it does not raise issues under international law. On the other hand, the non-forcible measures may run counter to an international obligation of the state. However, if the measure constitutes a countermeasure, its wrongfulness is precluded and the measure is justified under international law. A countermeasure is a measure taken in response to another state's internationally wrongful act with a view to getting that state to stop that act and obtaining reparation. Under the UN Charter, armed reprisals are prohibited. There was, this was made clear by the 1970. 1970 Friendly Relations Declaration, thus the term reprisals is no longer used and the term countermeasures is used instead. Countermeasures are by definition non-forcible. However, non-forcible measures must meet certain conditions to qualify as countermeasures. First, a countermeasure is only justified in response to a prior internationally wrongful act of another state. Second, a countermeasure must be proportionate to the prior wrongful act. When assessing proportionality, it is necessary to consider both the quantitative aspect of the injury suffered, as well as quanti qualitative factors, including the gravity of the breach and the importance of the interest protected by the rule. Third, the state must follow certain procedural requirements. The state must call upon the respondent, responsible state to fulfill its obligations and notify of its, of its decision to take countermeasures and offer negotiations. 
the state must suspend the countermeasure once the wrongful act has ceased and the dispute is submitted in good faith to a court. And fourth, the countermeasures must not depart from certain basic obligations. Now, an emergency situation may involve allegations of violation of obligations at a governance. In such a situation, a question may be raised as to whether third-party countermeasures are allowed under international law. That is, other states, even if they are not injured by the breach, can take countermeasures to get that state to stop the breach. The IOC took the position that third-party countermeasures were allowed under international law. However, in view of comments by states, the IOC eventually amended articles. The final articles left this question open by merely in including a saving clause to allow room for the development of international law. In times of emergency, the issue of third-party countermeasures may become particularly relevant. And of course, since the draft articles were published, we've had several important academic analyses of the state practice in this area, which suggests that in fact, there, there may be good support for its inclusion um, as a rule of customary international law. So this too is an area to watch and perhaps discuss over the coming days. Judge Iwasawa, it has been a, a real pleasure to discuss these three different areas with you that are central to the theme of this conference. And I think your marks have provided a perfect platform for us to explore those issues over the next two days and to develop um, uh, many of the questions that you have rightly highlighted. And we are acutely conscious of your incredibly busy diary and are delighted that you were able to, to come and join us at the London conference. Um, and we all owe you a huge debt of thanks. So ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in thanking Judge Iwasawa for his contribution. Thank you.